Selfishness is the number one cause of all the issues in the world today. Selfishness is the number one cause of all the issues we have in the world today. If you look at cancer, from what, I'm, what, I, what I've been told and what I understand is that cancer is a cell within the body that is a normal cell that starts misbehaving. It starts doing its own thing. And it doesn't care whether the whole body is going this direction, it's growing in that direction. Cancer illustrates what selfishness is. And it's almost like it doesn't know that, it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't know that if it destroys the body, it too will die. Selfishness is so deceptive when it comes within us, in our lives, when we have selfishness, that we cannot, we fail to see it within our lives. We fail to understand that it's there within us. I'll give you an illustration. A father comes home from work, and he comes home, he's really tired. He feels a little frustrated because he didn't have a good day. And there's children in the house, he's children, he's beloved children making some noise, and he gets angry, stirred up, there's anger that comes. He's like, I just need silence, I just need peace. And he manifests that, starts shouting at his kids. And his wife comes in and says, honey, could you, you know, speak, you know, lovingly to our children? And his anger even boils even more. Who do you think you are? Don't you see I'm trying to discipline our children? You just always try and spoil them when I'm trying to discipline them. But if we look deep within his heart, he's not really interested in disciplining his children. He's interested in peace of mind. It's about him. I remember when I was um, with some of the young people here at SVA, we went out for a camp. And while we were at the camp, there were time was, we were time to leave, and this younger man comes up to me, maybe he's about 13 or 14, I'm not sure what his age is, and I'm like way older than him, and we're busy packing the bags within the bus. And I take the last bag and I put it in, and he's like, you don't pack it there, take it the other way around. And I can just feel this thing boiling in me, inside me. Who are you to talk to me like this? You know the experience? Who are you? That selfishness, who are you? And I was like, no, you do it. And the Lord rebukes me, selfishness. Maybe you have bought a gift for a loved one or bought a gift for somebody. You think this gift is really nice and you present it to them and they don't really take interest in your gift as much as what you think they should. And that selfishness boils within you and says, they don't appreciate what I'm doing. They don't really care. You know the experience? Jesus if we have to look at his teachings and we had to distill it down to first principles, right to the very essence of his teachings, the book Desire of Ages tells us that the substance of Christ's teachings was self-surrender, letting go of selfishness and surrendering to the Lord. That was the essence of his teachings. He was constantly trying to teach his disciples over and over what it means to be selfless. And they failed to get it. They failed to get that aha moment. 
Let's go to John 13 and verse 1 to 3. John 13 and verse 1 to 3. We see the great controversy right there within the chapter. Two groups are represented within John chapter 13. Those that are, if I can say, let me not say those, that one group with, made up of one person who rejects the love of God and the others who are struggling with the selfishness. One completely rejects and portrays the ultimate narcissistic mindset of where selfishness can lead you to. One rejects the love of God and the others are struggling. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. The Bible is, is giving us insights into the character of Jesus. He is at the end of his road. He's going to die for us on the cross of Calvary. And this is his last moment that he has to spend with his disciples. The last moment he can, you know, connect and be with them. All he wants to do was encourage them and strengthen them. But things were going wrong there. Verse 2 tells us, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas, Judas, Iscariot, Simon's, si Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So here we see Satan entering into Judas. Judas is rejecting the love of Christ. We see the great controversy playing out there. If we had to sum up the great controversy in its simplest, it is selfishness versus love. That's what it is. Take it to its essence, selfishness versus love. And these disciples there are struggling there as you read and you, you compare the Gospels with one another. They are struggling and they're starting to have their favorite conversation, their favorite debate. Guess what that was? Who is going to be the greatest? Who will be the greatest? Who is going to be second in command? That was their conversation. And Jesus, instead of getting frustrated. Can you imagine? You've been trying to teach these, these disciples over and over what it means to be selfless and love, and they're not getting it. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and went to God. Verse 4, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So they're there in that upper room, if you can go with me in your imagination, they're there in that upper room, and they're busy arguing with one another, you know, or they're silently looking at each other, wondering who's going to be the greatest, and they're there, and they, the basins are there, they're about to maybe have supper, and somebody needs to wash their feet. There's no servant. And they're there, looking, I'm not going to do it, looking at each other, I'm not going to do it. Where's the servant? In earlier on, I was explaining in the previous service that dorm life, if you've ever stayed, stayed in a dorm, a hostel or something like that, you know what it is for people to do things that are strange. Leaving stuff lying around, you know, doing stuff that is just not in order or maybe, you know, what you think is clean or whatever that may be. And I remember there would be a time when we would come into the kitchen. We had a, 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 like a, a kitchen that we'd share, and somebody would just constantly leave the dishes dirty. And everybody would just, you know, go around the dishes, washing their stuff, including myself. I don't want to wash those dishes. I don't want to pick up that thing on the floor because I'm going to be the weaker one. They're going to take advantage of me. I don't want to be taken advantage of, so I won't do that. That's motivating us. 
And in the end, what happens to the environment? It just becomes more chaotic. Somebody needs to do it. Somebody needs to humble themselves and do it. And here we see Jesus humbling himself, the king of the universe, humbling himself, coming down and washing their feet. Jesus gives us the ultimate illustration of what it means to be selfless. Jesus was not, he didn't just come down and be a man. That would have been good enough if he came down to be a man and dwelt with us and just teached us. You know, if he just came down and he was a man and he was just a good teacher. No, he came down and he became a servant. He came to serve. And he didn't just come to serve. Paul tells us that he came to die for us on the cross. So he's going down and down and down. He came to die for us on the cross of Calvary. There's this beautiful quote that I'd love to read. Speaking about the love of God and what he did for us. It says, the, relationship, the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not a soul for whom he gave his beloved son. God's love is so deep for us. It's as if you're the only person on this planet when he loves you, as if you're the only one. And sometimes that might be difficult for us to understand. How is it possible for God's love to just love me as if I'm the only one and just love you, brother, as if you're the only one and just love you as if you're the only one and just love you as if you're the only one? How is that possible? And I'd like to give you an illustration of the sun. If you look outside at the sun, when it's shining and we're enjoying that warmth, Do you think in your mind and say, well, I'm having too much sun, I need to share it with somebody else? Or do you just experience that sunshine for yourself? You do, it's just shining on you and you're experiencing it just you. You, know, you don't think about, oh, the, I'm taking too much sun. And that's how Jesus' love is for one another. It's shining just on you, just upon me. There was a missionary who went to Thailand, and he was trying to explain to the Thai people the love of God. He spent some time in Thailand trying to, illust trying to help people to understand the love of God, and he thought that the story of the cross, in his experience, would have impact on the people. But some Buddhists didn't take that story very nicely. They were confused, and they thought that if a man dies, you know, in the Buddhist culture, if you die and you come back to life, then that must have been that you were evil in another life and you're coming back again, and that whole cycle. So they couldn't take the story of the cross very seriously. A friend of his came to him and asked, would you please help this monk? He's building a monastery. He's asking the missionary, would you please help this monk to illustrate what Christianity is? In this monastery, there would be different world religions, and each world religion would have the person that founded that religion and then an inscription underneath. And this missionary was asked by his friend to help this monk in order to represent Christianity. The missionary goes and meets up with the monk, and as he's thinking, what is it that I could use to show what Christianity is, show the essence of Christianity? The Holy Spirit puts this impression in his mind. Now pause for a moment. This is Thailand. Thailand has got 
specific cultures that they do. And one of the things in Thailand is that feet are not well looked upon. That is the lowest part of the body. I interviewed a friend of mine, or, you know, just had a conversation, asking him about how Thai people see feet. And he said that you can't sit. I'll just illustrate a little bit like this. You can't sit like this in Thailand because your feet are pointing somewhere. So you can't sit like this. You can't speak about your feet in public. You can rather speak about anything else, but not about feet. And he was telling me that when he used to be Buddhist, in the temple, they would have to make sure that their feet are not pointing, you know, those idols that they were there. They would have to hide their feet. So feet is the lowest part of the body. And obviously, guess which is the highest part of the body or the most important? The head. So you don't want to touch people's head in Thailand. You don't want to go and, you know, touch, hey, buddy, and, you know, touch them by the head. Coming back to the missionary. The monk comes up to him and says, opens up his Thai Bible and says, I think, and shows him something that I think we can use this to illustrate um, Jesus, the founder of your religion. And the missionary opens up to John 13. And he starts reading. Actually, sorry, he doesn't read. The missionary doesn't read. He tells the monk to read John 13. And you know what we find in John 13. We find there the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And you know what? The monk was silent. The missionary gulped. You know that awkward silence when everybody's, you know, you're just the two of you with somebody and there's this awkward silence. And the monk then he finally says, you mean your God, the founder of your religion, washed his students' feet? What a visual representation of the love of God. And that's what Christ did. Christ's love for us, summed up in John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Loved the world. The world, when we say the world, it's all inclusive. As I so, told you earlier on, his relationship to us is as distinct as if you're the only person in the world. That whosoever believeth, whosoever, it doesn't matter who you are. There's a beautiful quote in Signs of the Times that says, don't entertain the thought that because you've made mistakes, because, you, you, because your life has been darkened by errors, your heavenly Father does not have and will not hear when you pray. Don't entertain that. The quote goes on further to say, there is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. None have fallen so low, none are so vile, so vile, that they cannot find deliverance in Christ. The demoniacs of Gadara in the place of prayer could not utter only the word, could only utter the words of Satan, but yet the, the heart's unspoken appeal was heard. No cry from a soul in need is unheeded. Whosoever. Believeth in him should not do what? Should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us so much. And at this time that we take this moment to wash one another's feet, I ask you to, to think about what God did. He put those ordinances in place 
for us to remember. Our memories are very, they're very fickle. They, they, they don't work very well many times. And God has allowed us to constantly think. He wants us to remember his humility. Remember his selfless love. As we engage in this, I want you to remember that. I know right now during COVID, we will not be able to wash the way we'd like, wash one another's feet the way we'd like. And those of you who have your family members, sometimes we think because we have family members, we have love for one another, but there might be unsettled things within our hearts. So grab your family member, grab that, that, that close person that you stay with and take them and go and wash their feet and remember what Christ did. In Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus said, we need to do this in remembrance of him. The ordinance of humility or the ordinance of foot washing that we just did previously was a time when we searched our hearts, looked within in ourselves to see if selfishness is really ruling there. And it's a time that we look and we we confess to one another and allow God to take control of our lives. The second part of the service is not merely just reflecting, but it's joyful. Joyful, because behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. And I invite you right now to enjoy this beautiful time as we think about what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary. At this time, the elders will pray a blessing upon the emblems. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bread is such a fitting symbol. Every country, every continent, every culture has some, some form of bread. It's worldwide, which reminds me that you loved the world so much that you gave your only son. For you have given us the only bread we need, the bread of life. And so we seek your blessing upon this bread, the bread which is a symbol of Jesus' broken body. You willingly, lovingly gave. Jesus willingly obeyed. And now we gratefully receive this bread. Please. Bless, bless this bread, that as we partake, may we remember your great gift. And, me, and may we be spiritual strengthened. In Jesus' name, amen. And after they had broken your beautiful body and nailed it on the cross, to be absolutely certain of your death, a cruel guard thrust a spear into your perfect side, and as the blood flowed out, assuring your death, even more so, it assured our life, our salvation, our eternity with you. And so today, as we drink this wine, as you asked us to do, may we remember your sacrifice for us so that we could live with you forever. Amen. And the breaking of the bread symbolizes Jesus' body broken for us. And as I said early on, he said, do this in remembrance of me.
The wine symbolizes his blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. He didn't deserve to die, but he took upon himself your sin, my sin, the entire world, so that we will one day be reunited with him again. Take time and reflect on this wonderful gift that God has given us in his son. That beautiful verse, John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. As we looked earlier, the world represents God's breath. The breath, when I say the breath of his love, it's so wide. Not only did he love the world, you, me, each of us individually, but he gave, he gave everything showing the length that God's love is willing to go. Infinite length. Jesus didn't just do a sloppy work when he saved us. He did a complete, wonderful work. He even became part of us, uniting us as humans back with heaven. That whosoever believeth in him, showing the depth that the Lord's love is willing to go. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, God's love can reach you. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love is everlasting. This last piece symbolizes the height of God's love. The thoughts that God has for us, the things that he has planned for us, are beyond our imaginations, way beyond. At his right hand, the psalmist says, are pleasures forevermore. I encourage you to rededicate your life to Jesus and accept that wonderful love. After the service that they had in that upper room, they sang a song, and we'll be singing a song as well, hymn number 184. I invite you to stand, please, and look at the words on the screen.
Father in heaven, thank you, thank you so much, Lord, for your gift of love to us, for sending your Son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Lord, my prayer right now is that we will not just understand this intellectually, but we will experience it. We'll experience the depth of your love. I pray, Lord, that we will constantly keep our eyes focused on you, and constantly learn from you as you teach us and guide us on our way home. We are so close. So many things are happening in this world today. So many evil things and painful things. And Lord, you are ready to come and take us home. Almost ready, but you're just waiting for us to let go of our selfish hearts and accept you. So I pray, Lord, that we will experience that. Everyone who's watching this online, everyone that's in this room, everyone, Lord, I pray that we will not be like Judas and deny your love, but we'll accept it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.